As an actor, he has appeared in over 50 movies and TV shows, including the Rocky Horror Picture Show, Fight Club, and Tenacious D. But it's as a superstar rocker that he recorded one of the most successful albums of all time. His musical union with composer Jim Steinman has built a musical legacy that few can match. And their album, Bad Out of Hell, still sells over 200,000 copies annually, more than 30 years after its release. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with Grammy Award-winning performer, Meatloaf. find there's a difference between singing a song and performing one? Well, there's a huge difference. Most people don't know how to perform a song. Most people, Elvis knew how to perform a song. Springsteen knows how to perform a song. Um, there's a few people that really know how to perform a song. Aretha knew how to perform a song. Frank Sinatra knew how to perform a song. Uh, Roger Daltrey is somebody that knows how to perform a song. Um, performing a song and just singing the song, that's my problem with American Idol. Um, the ones that went on, Adam Lambert, for example, who went out to perform a song, they were constantly um, saying, you know, things like, well, why don't you just have a tank out here? I thought, what a great idea that is. <laughs> There's a huge difference in standing on a stage and singing a song and performing a song. Um, Critics, ignorant uh, critics, um, tend to believe that if you can't write the song, you can't possibly feel it. And that's to me, is like telling uh, Marlon Brando that uh, uh, in Streetcar Named Desire, because Tennessee Williams wrote it, he could possibly never feel the role or any movie, any play that's ever been written by anybody else, Hoffman, tell all these actors, Hackman, Hoffman, Pacino, De Niro, Johnny Depp, you didn't write the script, you can't possibly feel it. You can't possibly bring it to life. And, and that just goes to show you how um, uh, really idiotic that, and how pretentious and how they, they have no idea what they're talking about. When you first get a song, outside of like Steinman's work, when you get a song, can you tell immediately if it's one that you'll connect with or not? Um, sometimes there's potential in it, and I will, um, I, I, I've never sang any song that has not been reworked over and over and over again. Um, the character has to come to life. The character has to come to life. It's like a movie. If you, I read scripts all the time, and if there's no character development, and a lot of scripts, it's just about a story, but the stories aren't really interesting until you develop a character and you know who those people are. And so even if I take a movie where I think the character isn't developed enough, I will develop him inside him and force the director's hand into shooting what I believe. I, I, I have ways of doing that without, you know, <clears throat> just by putting a pretty little smile on my face and patting them on the head and telling them how good they are. And um, it's all about character development. Like last night, um, I was late. I, I forgot Song of Madness was coming. And, and it's like I, I get set there and I bring my characters to life in my head. And I was late getting set in my character. He, he never locked. He was in and out in that song. And it made me crazy after the show. Um, <clears throat> nobody else in the entire world would know right. but me. Uh, I, I was a hair late on little things. And it was, it was making me crazy. So it's, it's all about the character. It's all about the development. And especially with Hank Cool Teddy Bear, um, it's all about Patrick and, and the situations and the different characters and the different people that 
he, even though he's the same person, he becomes. Help me with that album a little bit, because what I'm interested in, was this Patrick story already written before the album started, or did it develop no. out of putting what the happened together? was a song literally fell out of the sky and hit me on the head, and I have no idea where it came from. The guy wrote it, doesn't know how I got it. The people that Which manage it, it, Peace on Earth. Okay. They don't know how I got it. My managers don't know how I got it. Nobody, there is nobody in existence that knows how this song appeared in my hand. And I heard this song, and Rob Cavallo had said to me, we had 19 other songs, and we cut three tracks, and he said, these other 19 songs, we're not going to be able to do the same tracks that we're done with, that we've done with these three, with these others. That doesn't mean they're bad songs. It's a different style. And we, you went for a style, and the first tracks we cut were a song called Like a Rose, Los Angeluser, and um, was it? Living on the outside. I don't remember what the third song was, but they were rocked and they were modern and they were contemporary and they were built in for a younger demo. If everybody can remember back, even in the 80s, like entertainment tonight would be about movies and about music. And, and the shows in the 70s would be about Don, you know, Don Kirshner and Rot and all, would be about, and they'd have movies, they'd have uh, Siskel and Ebert and they'd have they'd have real artistic shows about artistic things. Now it's about Paris Hilton getting busted for cocaine, and I don't know what her name is, wanting to reduce her breast size from G, and they don't do anything. But why uh, doesn't the industry learn? I mean, especially, take for example, Bad Out of Hell. Nobody wanted to touch that album. No. It goes on to be one of the top well, selling albums of all time. Well, that's because nobody wanted to touch it because, because it, it scared them, because they said, Nobody's want to hear this. And I said, dude, we just sold out Carnegie Hall. <laughs> and I don't have a record. And all I've done is play little clubs like Reno Sweeney's that holds 175 and this other club that holds 60. And we've been traveling around in New York City playing these little supper clubs. And I said, all of a sudden, somebody says, we're going to put you in Carnegie Hall. They said, wow. And we sold it out because of doing that. And it wasn't because, you know, I, I, I was, uh, you know, the sex image of all time. And uh, we had, you know, really scantily clad women. A and uh, Jim Steinman and I are nine examples of your rock gods. <laughs> and uh, what it was about was it about the, is the music touch the people. And I knew that. And it was the same as Rocky Horror. But let me ask that, though. If, in fact, you recognize that, how is it that the record execs never seem to recognize Stupid. It? But how can they all... And, I mean, I see this happen over again. With not they're not all stupid. Uh, you know, like at the time, we had a, a real... Um, we had a couple of supporters. Um, mm -hmm. Bo Austin at Warner Brothers was one. Uh, Russ Thyred at Warner Brothers was one. Lenny Warnerker at Warner Brothers was not one. So they refused. He, he said, I'm not having this record on my label. Uh, so Steve Popovich was one. Albert Grossman up at Bearsville was one. So there was, and there, the, Mo Austin and, and uh, Steve Popovich and those guys are real mu were real music guys. Mm -hmm. um, Clive Davis didn't get it because it didn't have just verse, bridge, chorus. Um, but, but Clive Davis... In a retrospect, later on, they asked him, is there one artist that you missed in not signing? And he said, yes, Meatloaf. And he, he said, I, I just didn't get it. He said, but obviously the audience did. It wasn't overnight. Um, I got another good six months to go on Hank Cool Teddy Bear. And I think I can make it connect. Um, it's never going to sell my bad in hell because nothing sells. Yeah. But if I can... It, it, look, if they want to, if I can get 20 million downloads, I'll take it. See, I'm shocked Los Angeles isn't a huge hit. Out there. I can explain this to you. It's, I can, because in, in the 70s and in the 80s, radio, it, it didn't make any difference uh, about anything other than the song. It was the radio programmers. In other words, 
Each station had its own radio programming. Mm -hmm. Each station was independent. Now it's one big giant thing. And if some guy over here says, oh, well, that's not going to work in Cincinnati. And that's not. And it's all about demographic. Los Angeles loser is a brilliant song. Well, I can tell you this. In England, they were smart enough in England that it was the number one most played song on the BBC Radio 2. Mm -hmm. So don't anybody here tell me that it doesn't work yeah. because it does. And it was big in Germany. And, and so, you know, for them to sit here and tell me, oh, Oh, this song doesn't work for our people. It's just stupid because they go, oh, well, we have a demographic that uh, is 16 to 24 and you're way too old. <laughs> it's, that's yeah. what it, that, that literally is what it's about. Yeah. It's about age demographic. And then you go, they go, well, we're going to start off at classic rock. And classic rock says, oh, our, our demographic is too old for this song. <laughs> A good song is a good... If you go back in history and you think of all the songs that would have come out right now mm -hmm. in this marketplace and what classic songs that people love and listen to would have never been heard because of how it's set up. Yeah. And the record executives say it's because of downloads. It's not. It's because... Music is nothing more than a Frigidaire refrigerator that hums at you. There's a, and the people that have the ability to go out and do the right record, big, big artists, and that will get played, they're lazy. They are now become lazy, and they make horrible records. Was there a point in your career where you realized Success didn't guarantee the next step, because I would success think success never off, guarantees the next step. And I would think coming off that out of hell, you must have thought, okay, we're going to be on easy street here. No, I, it's you, been I, 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 never, you never. I, I've never in my entire life thought I was going to be on easy street. Really? I've fought my entire life on everything I've ever done. Um, the acting world it, it likes me. Yeah. Almost every movie I've ever done. I've gotten nothing but positive reviews. I mean, I would say 98% of my reviews in a movie have been positive. There's been reviews where, well, they didn't use him enough or, right. you know, stuff like that. But I, I just know the accolades that Bob got from Fight Club. Mm -hmm. I, um, I know things about the Golden Globes and, and Crazy in Alabama, if it would have done better business, what, what was going on. An excellent movie that a lot of people and, have um, not seen. And uh, when I did Shakespeare in the Park for Joe Papp, um, I got rave reviews from the Times. And I never read Shakespeare. But I got rave reviews because they said I was a real person. And, and anything I do, acting, music, anything, it's about the truth. Mm -hmm. And it's about finding the truth. And for somehow some reason that was in it wasn't instilled it was a it was a gift and and i was lucky enough to figure it out i had to get thrown off the baseball team to to get to figure it out because i won't tell you what the coach said <laughs> I, I called him i was going to do the lead in the musical and he and he looked at me and he, he used a certain word you're going to do that blank musical over playing baseball well then you can't do both and I'm so rebellious that when somebody goes at me like that I told him take his baseball team shove it and I went and did the musical and that's when it all kind of started and it was a senior year in high school are and there times in your in your quiet times that you've looked back on the career, both film and in music, and you realize how much you have touched people's no, lives? No, I know, no, no, because it doesn't make any difference what you did yesterday. It really doesn't. And like last night was a great show. I mean, we, we uh, that's the best show that place has seen in ten years, and I'm gonna tell them so. <laughs> and uh, and 
my focus now is I'm going to Orlando. Now, that show has to be better than that show. So what happened yesterday means nothing. That and 250 will get you a cup of Starbucks. But when you step out on the stage, and, and I saw last night, and you realize that all of these people, they know every word of what you're about to say. They're so in tune with it. And you realize, as you mentioned, some people have used your songs at weddings, and it's become the soundtracks of their lives. Yeah. It's not that you've had but, a I mean, that, successful I'm not the only, career. I mean, the, the Beatles, I mean, there's Springsteen. Right, you're in a handful of people and, that know, really have a, there's touched. A, there's a lot of uh, the Beatles, Springsteen, Billy Joel, you know, become... Um, um, I, 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 probably the soundtrack of my life would be Hotel California. Yeah. That's like that, that and, um, and um, um, uh, there's a Dobie Gray album and Linda Ronstadt. If those were the three people that had the most influence on me, um, would uh, Linda, I, I would say of any singer in the world, singer, because Linda, she's a singer. Right had more influence on me than anybody it's Ronstadt which is a very strange thing but yeah but uh, when you're up there you must realize you no, I don't realize I, I, it is doesn't it? it's not there it's not there I'm no I'm off I'm in I'm we're doing peace on earth and and those things um, if I break character in the middle of Los Angeles loser uh, away from Patrick to deliver that little speech to the audience. Yeah. Because, and that was real hard on the record not to do as myself. Excuse me, because the speech is so fitting. Um, but live, I give it, I, I, I give it to the audience. But on um, Peace on Earth and, and Living on the Outside and Song of Madness, um, took the words, bat. Uh, we have fun with hot patootie. Uh, I, I don't take that Eddie character because I, I said I would never bring Eddie back to the stage, so I don't. I just play around and have fun with the girls. And uh, it's just like this fun little thing. But once we get into Break It, that's a character. And he's, they're dead serious. So half the time, I couldn't tell you what the audience is doing. I, because the audience, I don't thrive on the audience. Most, I would say 90% of the performers draw their energy from an audience. I don't. I give the same show in front of three trees, <laughs> and you wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. Um, is it always work for you, or does it ever cross over into fun? Or is it both? No, the same? no, you can tell I have fun. As we get, a pa paradise is fun. I mean, Paradise is hysterical. Um, <laughs> and then I start to have fun with Boneyard, and, and then we go into Freebird, which everybody just couldn't believe I wanted to do, but it works great <laughs> into All Revved Up. And then we fire the guns. Those, that, those are the fun moments. But when, we're, when I'm dead serious inside those songs, oh, I'm dead serious. I, I couldn't even tell you what the reaction to the audience is when the songs are over, especially after Peace on Earth going into Living on the Outside. Because... Patrick's in a daze, and he, Patrick doesn't know where he is, so I am totally locked into Patrick. I have no idea what anybody's doing around me, other than when I know that the song starts. Yeah. I couldn't tell you what the band's doing, I couldn't tell you what the audience is doing, I couldn't tell you what anybody is doing. Where did the style of performing come from for you? When did you realize that's how you have to deliver Because that's song? how an actor is. Yeah. If you're not that... If you're not that in a play, and you're not that in a film, when I'm doing film, there I don't see cameras, I don't see anything. There's an actor and there's a me, and and if there's not another actor, it's me. Cameras are gone, crew is gone, they disappear. They're gone. I'm so locked that nothing exists. Do you prefer? Acting film-wise or music on stage same or recording? Difference. It's all the same? It's the same difference, only I have to stay in time. <laughs> I can't. There's things that I would do, and I do every once in a while, but I catch up inside the songs that you would do. There's, there's beats in acting. 
and in 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 some styles, there's a real tempo that is, is equivalent to music. But in a lot of in, in, in most contemporary pieces, there's beats, but there's no time. Right. It, it, you you know you can have four four bar inside a two four inside a three four inside of a one four bar, um, if you want to take it musically when you're acting, because you can have these huge long dramatic pauses. And that if the director's smart enough to let them work, if the actors are really locked, where you and you see it where they where they where they do nothing but he cuts back and forth between the looks. And if he's really good and these two actors are really good, it will really keep you on your seat to if the tension's right, what are they gonna do next? And and it and it's like if you can get an actor and and you have to have a you have to have a good actor with you. You, to 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 let that 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 flow because yeah. that's what it is. It's like I work with Glenn Close and and she's that kind of actress, and and it's just like let that flow go, and we're talking without talking, and uh, that's the hardest thing as an actor. The hardest thing as an actor is not the dialogue; it's what to do when you're not talking. That's the hardest thing. And that's what I teach my band. Uh, because I, my band is in acting school every day. About timings, about when to move, when to do this. It, it's, it's, it, it looks very improv, and it, and it is to a point, but it's not to a point. Because they know about tension, they know about dropping their shoulders, they know about this. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've talked to... All people have come to see my show, and they they realize that there's something different about it. And and uh, big big names big yeah. names we won't get them have come to me and go, can we talk to you? <laughs> I go, yeah. So I you know tell them look, I just gave a note to a band guitar player the other day in a band I went to see, and they said we got it on film. We'll check it out. I said check it out. Watch what he does. Okay, we're running out of time. Last thing I want to ask you though, I read something that disturbs me greatly. That Teddy Bear might be your last studio album. No. No. Okay. No. Not true. No, don't pay attention to what I'm writing. I only do it to piss people off. <laughs> well, good, because you pissed me off, but now I'm happy that everything's okay. No, I just get, I get tired of, um, um, it, it, it's like, my mother used to say, be happy in the clothes God gave you and be happy in your life and be happy with what you got and don't worry about what you don't have be happy with what you have and we're in an age of so much self-importance and so much in attitude of entitlement mm -hmm. that I just want to go around and choke people <laughs> I won't um, but when people get something and, and they, they say they're fans and then they start this dribbling on about this and that and this and that, and then I write little things about, well, did you read the short story? Well, I've read it all. Well, then shut the up. And so they make me mad. So I tell them, okay. I'm doing this and that, and then the fat lady's going to sing. I, I just, I just want to get them yeah. because it's my only opportunity to get them back. And then they go, oh, don't quit. Don't stop. Don't stop. Oh, it's too late now. You people piss me off. <laughs> I don't care about you people anymore. I want you all to go away. You really need to learn to appreciate what you have. You need to appreciate your life. You need to appreciate your loved ones. I was watching a show, and it was really depressing. But it was about families in L.A. with two, three kids. And dad was working. But they couldn't afford any more than these transit motels, one-room motels. And, and, and it was this whole expose on that. But there was, every time they went in to talk to one of these families, now, whether they were putting on a good face or not, but 
but what they were all saying was, look, and some of them been homeless, and, and the little girl goes, yeah, we were homeless, my mama. It was hard. I, I didn't, I was scared, but now we're here, and they will make sure that they sit at the dinner table, and they have dinner as a family together. It was very sad to watch, but, in, but it was also that the father came home, the mother sat there, they did, they put, they made sure that they had the family time, and every one, there was about 12 of those families. Now, they, that is a typical example of appreciating what you have at the moment, knowing that you want to improve your situation and, and willing to work for it. That's the other thing. There is no free rides. That's why you say, I don't live in my past. I live in Orlando right now. <laughs> and Meatloaf, I cannot say anything, but thank you so much for doing You're this. You're welcome. Pleasure. Meatloaf. Okay. Bye, kids. <laughs>